And welcome back, everybody, now to the Weltsaal. The regulars amongst you, ladies and gentlemen, will probably remember the green sofa that has become an icon of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. It stands not only for the intensive exchange here at the BETD, but also for our focus on networking with other summits and events worldwide to foster global dialogue on the energy transition. So between our conferences, the Green Sofa used to travel around the globe. It has toured six continents, welcomed thousands of people and prestigious guests. Alas, those travels were suspended last year due to the pandemic. Until we can resume them, we have a virtual version of the Green Sofa, and in this session, it provides a platform for dialogue that has become a tradition here at the BETD, bringing together the International Energy Agency and the International Renewable Energy Agency, both of them, of course, uniquely positioned to steer the global transformation of energy systems. So I'm going to welcome our speakers in just a moment, but before I do that, we do have an audience question for you, and it concerns the priorities that you believe that the IEA and IRENA should have. So we're asking you what work areas should the IEA and IRENA prioritize, and please, if you are a registered user, user, use our Slido window to tell us what you think the main priorities should be. And as you see, this is a word cloud. We're starting to get some words, and uh, we're going to come back to that in just a moment after I introduce our speakers and take a look at our world, word cloud. So I would like to begin by introducing Dr. Fatih Birol. He is executive director of the International Energy Agency and joins us remotely. And I'm also very pleased to welcome Francesco La Camera. He is director general of the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. And now, before we uh, get uh, a first uh, input and presentation, let me just quickly go back to the Mendimeter word cloud. Wow, developed quickly, I must say. So we've got, of course, renewables at its center, which uh, is uh, appropriate given our topic here. We also have just transition high up there in terms of priorities, long-term planning, hydrogen also emphasized here in our word cloud, and energy transition, of course, as well. And then a lot of uh, other phrases being uh, entered here, legislative framework, access to energy services, community energy, citizen energy, cooperation, uh, infrastructure, and more. So, very good, thank you very much. And we will now begin with a presentation by Francesco La Camera, which, who brings us the latest numbers on a net zero scenario, showing that the 1.5 degree goal is still technically and economically feasible. Please, Mr. La Camera, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be with you at the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. Arena has been privileged to be part of the BATD since its establishment, and I'm delighted to be in this session again with my good friend Fatih Birol. This is an important annual milestone in the global energy discourse, and we are looking forward to the discussion uh, over the coming few days. The BTD team energy event towards climate neutrality captured the essence of this moment in time. Science is clear. According to the IPCC Special Report 1.5, energy emission must reach zero in 2050. 45% of global greenhouse gas emission must be reduced by 2030 compared to 2010. We are entering the decade which will define whether we have a fighting chance in keeping temperature rise to 1.0 degrees. This reality is becoming clear to many. Despite the ongoing health crisis and economic difficulties, countries, regions, cities, and companies continue to make ambitious commitment to climate action and net zero strategy. 
The funding of ARENA's World Energy Transition Outlook Preview we are launching today outlines how the energy system must change to align with the 1.5 degree trajectory. Let me stress that the pathway is not easy, but fundamentally, the energy transition can be a great vehicle not only for decarbonization, but also for a new economy that is inclusive, prosperous, and resilient. As you can see from the slide, the window of opportunity, we say, is narrow. This is why ARENA 1.5 Celsius pathway prioritizes technologies available today together with continued innovation so that we can be deployed at scale by 2030 and make a meaningful shift towards a net zero energy system by 2050. We see six key avenues for emission reduction with renewable efficiency and electrification provided for the bulk of CO2 abatement, abatement by 2050. Electricity become the main energy career. Please, next slide. The most important shift is the increasing use of low-cost renewable power to electrify end use like transport and heat. Electricity generation must expand threefold, with renewables providing 90% of the total supply by mid-century. Clearly, this is only achievable if supported by ambitious energy efficiency strategies. Let me also highlight that we consider hydrogen to, green hydrogen to be a key solution in industry and transport. ARENA envisages green hydrogen a major energy career and cost competitive with blue hydrogen by 2030 or before. This is a large task, but we have already entered this new energy reality. Financial markets are start, starting to shift towards sustainable energy assets. Please, next slide. For example, the share of the fossil fuel heavy energy sector in the US Standard Poor Index dropped significantly from 13% a decade ago to below 3% today. In 2020, the Standard Poor Clean Energy Index was up by 138% compared to the fossil fuel heavy, heavy, heavy uh, energy index, which was down by 37%. This trend will continue. But the 1.3 agenda requires a different speed and scale. So we go to the next slide and talk about in investment. The plan is placed envisage 98 US trillions, US dollar trillions of investment by 2050. ARENA's outlook shows that uh, an additional 33 US dollar trillion is required to align with 1.5 degrees. Government funds, including the short-term stimulus and recovery funds, can leverage private investment by a factor of three or four. They must be used strategically to guide investment decisions towards energy transition priorities. ARENA Outlook is also clear on what must not be done. As the UN Secretary General stressed a few days ago, we cannot continue to invest in polluting technology such as coal, especially in the power sector, if we want a fighting chance. All new coal projects in the pipeline should be abandoned for more sustainable solutions. This means that uh, 24 US, dollar, US uh, trillion dollars of the planned investment must be redirected away from fossil fuel to energy transition technologies. The emerging system is not a full replacement. It is a new energy system based on decentralized technologies that take advantage of the digital solution, continued innovation, and low participation of many actors. This brings me to the final but critical point. The energy transition cannot longer be limited to technology choices or mitigation efforts. Please go to the next slide. Oh, this is already there. Thank you. Policy to support, policy to support the growing deployment and integration of renewable energy must go hand in hand with measures to ensure that industrial and other economic capabilities are aligned with the development and climate objective. Labor market measures can help create a well-trained workforce 
and the sure people find jobs. Our last jobs review showed that 11.5 million people work in the renewable energy sector today. Investing in the transition will create three times more jobs than fossil fuels for each million dollar of spending. At the same time, social protection policies are essential to allow fossil fuel workers to retrain and develop new careers. Combined with these policies, support a structural shift while making sure that people and communities can thrive and that the economy are more inclusive, just, and resilient. In a few weeks, we will release a detailed socioeconomic footprint of the pathway I presented today, along with policy recommendations and analysis of financial, financing sources. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Arena Outlook showed that we need the highest level of commitment and ambition to make a rapid shift to 1.5 degree course. As I mentioned at the outset, the task is daunting, but we must try. 2021 will be an important year in, this, in the next decade. In 2021, will take place two important milestones for collective action. The UN high-level dialogue on energy in September and the COP26 in November. ARENA is playing its part and co-lead the energy transition track towards the high-level dialogue on energy and collaborating with the COP26 presidency for the full success of the conference. And this collective action is what we need. Many of you were part of the ARENA, Arena First Assembly, which took place 10 years ago. In April, in April 2011, the agency had just 65 members. Within a decade, this number grew to 164 members and 20 countries in a session. And this global force moved renewables from niche to the center of the energy discourse. <clears throat> we have come a long way, and it's now the time to take this progress to the next level. Our shared future depends on it. Thank you very much. Back to you, my lady. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, Director General, also for your emphasis there uh, toward the end of your remarks on jobs and inclusion, uh, because as we could see in our word cloud, climate justice uh, on the minds of many of those uh, who are listening to us here today. I have a question or two for you, but we're going to go first to Dr. Birol uh, to hear, uh, hear what the IEA has, uh, has been focusing on. And in fact, you have done quite a lot of work over this past year on the topic of building back better after the pandemic. So let's hear now what you have learned in terms of emissions and how we can accelerate clean energy transitions to reach net zero. So uh, many thanks for the invitation to International Energy Agency to share our views about the uh, uh, energy transitions and uh, climate change. Yes, we made a lot of work on the build back better, but we also said build back better altogether. So this altogetherness is important in terms of having the everybody uh, on board. So I would like to use uh, uh, a few reminders first, where we are today in terms of emissions. Because one of the things we said, you underlined, uh, uh, Madam Moderator, we said if the governments do not put the clean energies in their economic recovery packages, emissions will be there in the beginning of 2021, where they were before the COVID crisis. This was our uh, uh, rather uh, nightmare scenario because the emissions as a result of the economic downturn declined in the year 2020, about 6%. But we said, be careful, be careful. Emissions will rebound if the governments do not change their policies. Many colleagues thought that the, during the COVID crisis, the human beings uh, had better hearts better understanding of the energy and environmental issues, and they will not again use those emitting uh, equipments, cars, uh, uh, installations, and others. We said, no, there is a need for 
government policies. There may be changes in the human behavior, but this will not be decisive. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we were right. We were right once again, because what we have seen is of December 2020, global emissions are higher than the year before. Emissions, yes, they declined throughout the COVID year, uh, last year, but with the economies are recovering, they are back again higher than before the crisis. Why it is happening? Uh, uh, very simple, because many major economies around the uh, world, their economies are uh, recovering, and with the recovery of their economies, we are seeing their emissions are recovering as well. So in 2021, this year, we expect a strong rebound of the global emissions unless rapid and major policies are introduced by uh, governments. So therefore, this is a reminder, in my view, in the absence of decisive government policies, emissions will not go down. And this highlights the importance of government policies. And in my view, the world might miss a historic opportunity to make the 2019 emissions as a peak, because we may well see emissions to rebound again this uh, year and the years after, unless major policies are not put in place. So the IEA is doing everything we can at the, uh, in our headquarters in Paris and with all the colleagues around the world to make sure that uh, this year we are moving very strongly in terms of clean energy transitions. And I wanted to highlight four uh, contributions that we are doing. First of all, at the end of this month, the uh, UK COP presidency and the IEA jointly hosting a major net zero summit, 31st of March. Mr. Sharma and myself uh, will chair this meeting, and we have all the key countries there, especially four major economies or emitters. Uh, Mr. Kerry from the United States, the special envoy, uh, Mr. Xi Shenhua, the Chinese top climate change uh, envoy, Mr. Timmermans, uh, executive vice president of EU, and uh, Mr. R.K. Singh uh, from India, uh, Indian uh, minister. But in addition to that, we have uh, more than 40 ministers, thought leaders, civil society, and others. We will not have a meeting to see our faces in the, in the video, but we will see what kind of principles can be put in place that we all agree to enhance the international clean energy technology cooperation. The second contribution we have is on the uh, critical uh, minerals. The hopefully very rapid uh, deployment of clean energy technologies imply a significant increase in the demand of some of the critical minerals, such as nickel, cobalt, magnesium, and copper, many, many uh, others. And with this, it raises uh, questions, as some of those critical minerals are focused in a few countries in terms of supply, uh, whether or not it will have any new energy security concerns. Or are there any concerns uh, regarding how they are produced in terms of environmental and social uh, footprint? And we are going to look, what does it mean? The increasing number of electric cars, windmills, solar panels, and the other energy technologies on the supply side in terms of critical minerals, whether or not this will put any pressure on the markets, on the uh, uh, energy uh, world in terms of the prices, in terms of availability, in terms of energy security and others. 
The third area, which I believe is the uh, very critical area, clean energy transitions uh, and the investments uh, to foster that coming from uh, Europe, North America is good, but this is far, far being from enough. Because when we look at the IES, World Energy Outlook, a, a book that uh, uh, been around since uh, almost uh, 30 years, we all know that the more than 90% of the emissions are coming from emerging countries. The growth is coming from emerging countries. So, but if you look at the finance in clean energy in those countries, there is a big gap between what is happening in Europe, for example, and what is happening in emerging countries. How do we, how do we accelerate the finance in clean energy in emerging uh, countries? It's a major uh, work we are uh, carrying out together with World Bank and the World Economic Forum. We are go going to release in June. In my view, in my view, if we cannot solve this problem, it is one of the fault lines of our fight against uh, climate change. Finally, uh, we are working on our roadmap, world's roadmap on net zero by 2050. And uh, I would uh, like to give you some information on that I finish my uh, words. So, we have started uh, uh, this uh, last September 2020 with this work. We have uh, huge modeling teams in the IEF for different issues, for world energy outlook, energy technology perspective, for renewables, all of them. I brought them together and in September we started to model uh, a net zero by 2050 energy world. And uh, January 11, we have announced this with a huge press conference uh, uh, to the world. Our plans for the IEA uh, this year, including our world's roadmap to net zero by 2050. And we have been working with several institutions, uh, modeling institutions uh, around the world with IPCC, with UK, US, uh, Japan, China, European Commission, several of them. Uh, how to model uh, best there and to, to learn from their experiences, get their critics, get their views in order to uh, make a rigorous, a solid modeling uh, uh, framework. And uh, recently, uh, this month, we uh, organized a webinar about 200 models around the world. Uh, we, are, we were very happy, uh, colleagues from IPCC to US, China, India, everywhere. They were there. I was very happy to have also colleagues from IRENA joining to that meeting, and we got their uh, wonderful views and their suggestions, which we are uh, working on. Now, we also are going to, as I said, make the summit on 31st of March uh, with the UK uh, COP uh, presidency, and we will get views from the world energy and climate uh, leaders about the net zero 2050. We are going to our report. Uh, the first draft will go to peer reviewers uh, around the world to get their feedback. Uh, uh, what they think is right, what they think is wrong, how we can improve our uh, work. And uh, we are hoping, uh, not hoping, we will, on 18th of May, we will uh, release our report to international press uh, with a press conference in Paris. And I should also tell you that uh, this report is officially requested by the COP presidency in order to provide a, a basis for the discussions of the world leaders in COP in Glasgow in November. And uh, as I said, this report will build a bridge, will build a bridge between Paris and uh, Glasgow, and we are very happy to support the COP presidency, UK presidency in that respect. Finally, uh, Madam Moderator, what will we are trying to do in this uh, report? Just three things. Uh, first of all, 
we want to assess the scale of the uh, challenge uh, here. We are going to look every single subsector existing in the world, uh, uh, subsector by subsector, what is uh, required to bring their emissions to uh, net uh, zero. And uh, we are going to assess the existing targets announced vis-a-vis -vis the uh, current uh, situation those subsectors are uh, in. Then we are going to map out a pathway. Our uh, modeling uh, uh, context, when we built with the ETP and Virta, like other modeling coming together for this very uh, important uh, assignment, we have more than 800 different technologies we are assessing uh, one by one, and we are looking what kind of key milestones the world needs in order to reach those targets. For example, when do we in the world need to ban sales of the internal combustion engine cars worldwide? Last one. Or until when the world can bear to build an iron steel plant run by fossil fuels. So key milestones for the governments in order to give them a more concrete picture of the task they have uh, in front of uh, them. And these will be actionable, not in the air, but actionable uh, policy advice for the governments on a sector by sector uh, uh, basis. And we will also discuss the uh, implications. For example, oil sector. Today we uh, consume about 100 million barrels per day of, of oil. It will go down sharply. What are the implications for the oil industry? What are the implications for the current car manufacturers around the world and those uh, workers? We are going to discuss those things, but also the emerging opportunities coming from uh, these uh, transitions will be a part of it. We also going to discuss the wider implications. We are working with the International Monetary Fund as well as other institutions. And uh, we have built a global commission on the pupil-centered economic, uh, uh, pupil-centered clean energy transitions under the chairmanship of the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark, Mrs. Mette Frederiksen, having uh, some 25 leaders around the world, we will look at the implications on the societies. Because uh, we think the clean energy transitions should be, as a result of the support coming from the people, not despite the people. People shouldn't think that the clean energy transitions will take their jobs from them, energy prices will go higher, or energy security will be in question. So we have to assure them, therefore, we put the people at the center of the clean energy transitions. So as such, uh, we are ready uh, for this year's uh, uh, plans and this year's and uh, beyond. And it is uh, great to uh, make a contribution to the BETD meeting uh, once again, together with my dear colleague, uh, Francesco La Camera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol, also for your emphasis on the need to leverage financing for the green transition in developing and emerging economies, underlining a message we also heard from Patricia Espinoza there and a subject that we will be picking up on later in the dialogue. Gentlemen, we have exactly one minute left on the clock. I do have one super short follow-up for each of you with the request literally for a two-sentence answer. First of all, to uh, Director General uh, La Camera, if I may, you've emphasized time is running out. We've heard that from lots of other speakers. You've also told us you now have a very wide membership. How do you want to translate your findings into practice on the ground? Two sentences. <laughs> Uh, first sentence is trying to collaborate closely with all our members, member states and put them in contact with the, the private company under our collaborative framework that we have, op we have opened for all the teams 
that are energy uh, transition relevant. Other, other, the other aspect is working on the climate investment platform that we launched last year with UNDP, C for All, in collaboration with the Green Climate Fund. We have more than 300 partners, all the multilateral financial institutions, the most important companies, develop, develop agency, development bank. I hope that we have already a pipeline of 200 energy transition related projects. We hope that we can make the finance arrive where it's more needed. Thanks, thanks to you. Thank you so much, Director General. And now back over to Fatih Birol. Uh, same request, if you'd be so kind. Looking toward the COP26, uh, uh, looking at political momentum in 2021, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, I am uh, definitely optimistic. Uh, there are three reasons for that. Uh, uh, many countries are putting strong pledges to have a carbon neutrality in 2050 uh, or a bit uh, later. And the political momentum is very strong. And the, with the United States uh, coming uh, soon, joining this group will make the political momentum even stronger. The second reason I am uh, optimistic uh, because the several clean energy technologies uh, are getting cheaper and also affordable in many, many parts of the world. We are seeing this is a great, a great opportunity. People will go for these options, solar or wind or efficiency solutions, not only to save the world, but simply because they are cheaper. This is the second reason. And third reason, uh, I see the youth is behind this very strong momentum. And I have seen, when we look at the last 50 years, the political uh, history of the world, if the uh, world's youth come together, and they are coming together, they can be a strong engine of the change. And because of these three reasons, uh, I believe I am an optimistic man, and the COP26 will result in good and Thank unmistakable uh, uh, direction uh, for the investors around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol. And indeed, we heard some very powerful youth voices here earlier today. I'm very grateful to both of you for being with us for our traditional green sofa dialogue, this time around in virtual form. Uh, all the best, gentlemen. Mm -hmm.